Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this bonus episode of the Talking Deen podcast. I'm your brother Rash and I want to share with you my thoughts about why today, the 3rd of March, is a very significant date in the history of Islam and for Muslims. Sadly, it's significant for unfortunate reasons and is in my opinion our darkest day. 96 years ago, in terms of the Western Gregorian calendar, and actually nearly 99 years in terms of the Islamic calendar, on the 3rd of March, the Islamic State was abolished. The true Islamic State. What many of us may have heard of as the Khilafah was abolished. In other words, Islamic governance, meaning the very comprehensive implementation of the Quran itself in society, was officially dismantled. What our beloved Prophet ﷺ himself put in place in Yathrib, which we today call Medina, came to an end after over 13 centuries. The very word Khalifa itself means successor, as each leader after the Prophet ﷺ was a successor in leading the Muslims, and this successorship ended. During the revelation of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to our beloved Prophet rules and regulations for individuals but also for all of society through this governance at every single level including the economy, social interactions, the justice system and pretty much every interaction that you can think of between us as people and everything around us be it other people, be it animals, be it the whole earth this implementation of the Quran was officially no more and Islam was pushed into the homes and cloaked under secularism where it no longer was allowed to play a role in deciding the rules that govern us as human beings created by the Almighty. It was this Khilafah system of Islamic governance that united all of the Muslim lands together and bound us on the basis of Islamic brotherhood instead of which soil we were born on or which national flag we carry, or the colour of our skin. We officially succumb to the fact that what Allah says in Surah al maida no longer had a reality on this earth. When he said, This day I have perfected for you your deen, and completed my favour upon you, and have chosen Islam as your deen. This was no longer a reality on this earth. That which is perfect, that which is comprehensive, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us was shunned into the homes and the mosques and no longer allowed to form societal rules. An even simpler way to look at it and a way to explain it to our children is that a large part of the Quran was taken away from us. We can still read those parts but we can no longer implement them. And as we should know, the Quran came to be lived and acted upon and not only recited. We often mention to non-Muslims about how well Islam regulates our lives, how it teaches us discipline, fairness, justice, caring for others and builds the type of spirituality and connection with our Creator that is so absent from today's society. What we perhaps don't appreciate is that this very Islam did not only come for the individual to regulate their life but also to regulate all of society. Our Creator presented for us a comprehensive set of interconnected systems designed to create a very God-conscious society. A society that was able to control man's destructive traits whilst allowing his more constructive traits to flourish. This regulation of society based on the laws, the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was lost and now nearing a hundred years without it returning. To be fair, the 3rd of March was the inevitable fall of the state of Islam. Our Ummah had gradually been declining for over a century in her clarity of Islam and really not appreciating the importance of Islamic governance and unity. Things like Arab nationalism had taken root, foreign and secular thoughts had entered the Ummah. Muslims were easily being duped into thinking that Western ideals being adopted rather than Islamic ones were the way forward. After World War I and the defeat of the Islamic State, often referred to in history books as the Ottoman Empire or the Uthmani Khilafah, the colonising of our lands took shape. 
This military defeat and subsequent colonising of our lands merely followed what had already been occurring in terms of the colonisation of our thoughts and ideas. What was left to do was the exiling of the leader of all the world's Muslims, the Khalifa Abdul Majid II, now deposed with his family being forced out from modern day Turkey by the traitor Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. What followed was the British and the French enforcing their policy of divide and rule, carving up the Muslim world through what is well known as the Sykes-Picot Agreement into the nation states we see today. Over the following years, many of the nation states we see in Muslim lands embraced the colours of the flag of Hijaz, the flag of Arab revolt, the combined colours of black, green, white and red. Many Muslims proudly carrying aloft the very flags that represent our disunity and the cutting up of Muslim lands. Sadly, many do not even consider that when they wear the Palestinian flag in solidarity with the oppression of our brothers and sisters, they are carrying colours which represent the reason Palestine is not being liberated today with the armies of our Ummah. Today's podcast is not to give you a timeline of events or a history lesson, as what happened is well documented and for all to see, and certainly we cannot change it. But it is important to understand the significance of what changed after we lost our unity, where Islam as a single entity, spanning from Indonesia in the east to Morocco in the west, we became like vassal nation states, all subservient to the western nations and made to be even weaker as we lost control of our armies to puppet regimes and leaders that were placed in charge of our lands. This led to nationalism, the very nationalism our Prophet ﷺ warned us of when he said, He is not one of us who calls for Asabiyyah, who fights for Asabiyyah or who dies for Asabiyyah. This Asabiyyah is nationalism, is patriotism, is this tribalism, is all of these bonds that are not the bond of Islamic Brotherhood. So when the Prophet ﷺ told us, only the Imam is a shield behind whom you fight and you protect yourself with. This Imam he was referring to was the Khalifa, was the leader of the Muslims, was the Amir al Mu'mineen. Our Prophet ﷺ, he warned us that it was this shield that was protecting us and our enemies they were not merely satisfied with occupation and division, rather they worked to ensure that this shield would never return again or could not rise again. So when Lord Curzon, the British Foreign Secretary, announced quite brazenly, we must put an end to anything which brings about any Islamic unity between the sons of the Muslims, the situation now is that Turkey is dead and will never rise again. We have destroyed its moral strength, the Caliphate and Islam. And if that wasn't enough for him to say this, they went on and they maintained this disunity by planting an entity in the heart of Muslim lands, the very Zionist state of Israel. Do we not remember when one of our previous Khalifas, the great Abdul Hamid II, refused to give up the land of Palestine? What did he say when he was offered money? to sell the land of Palestine. He said, I cannot give away a handful of the soil of this land as it is not my own. It belongs to the Islamic nation who have fought for the sake of this land and irrigated it with our blood. The Jews may keep their millions. If the Islamic Khilafah is one day destroyed, then they would be able to take Palestine without a price. While I am alive, I would rather push a sword into my body than see the land of Palestine taken away from the Islamic State. This is the response of a real leader. The Prophet ﷺ told us of this significant day and its repercussions when he said, Verily, the knots of Islam will be undone one by one. Whenever one knot is lost, then the people grabbed onto the one which came after it. The first of these knots will be the ruling and the last will be the Salah. When we lost the knot of ruling, the Islamic State, everything else became exposed. Even our very Salah itself, which is one of our biggest barriers to the hellfire, became exposed. Do we not see today how easily people are leaving the Deen or neglecting all of their Islamic obligations, including the Salah? 
You see, Islam places great importance on unity, not just via the brotherhood to one another, but also by recognizing there can only be one leader. Why else would the Prophet ﷺ say, when oath of allegiance has been taken for two caliphs, kill the one for whom the oath was taken later. In another narration he says, he who comes to you when you are united and wants to disunite your community, kill him. This single unified leadership is paramount. These sayings of the Prophet ﷺ show just how significant a single unified leadership is to the Muslims. If it wasn't obvious based on our situation today, then certainly we should take heed in the advice our beloved Prophet ﷺ has left us. You see, Islam came as a mercy to mankind, not just Muslims. Today, humanity is in darkness and misguidance today under capitalism and liberalism and all of these other isms. So many are oppressed and in poverty at the hands of a few who hoard so much of the world's wealth. Millions die of starvation on one side of the world, while millions live in depression due to the materialistically driven society around them on the other. So when Allah says, this is a book which we have revealed to you, that you may bring forth men by their Lord's permission from utter darkness into light to the way of the mighty, the praised one. What is he referring to? He is referring to Islam bringing mankind out of darkness. It was the system of Islam that took us out of the darkness when Islam arrived at our shores, when the Sahaba and the Khalifas after them liberated the lands we were born in. Today, we appear to have forgotten that if it wasn't for the implementation of the Sharia, if it wasn't for the spreading of Islam physically, if it wasn't for the many famous battles that we read of, then we may not even be Muslims ourselves. The question to ask ourselves is what will it take for us to give the topic of Khilafah the importance it deserves? Is it the current situation in Delhi, where mosques are being burnt, houses raided, our pregnant sisters being kicked in the stomachs? Or is it the ongoing plight of the Yuga Muslims or the Rohingya Muslims? Certainly the continuous oppression the Muslims of Kashmir and Palestine have been facing hasn't kicked us into action yet. Or perhaps we need something to become an issue closer to home. Perhaps the teaching and normalizing of LGBT, homosexuality, atheism to our children Something needs to break the camel's back as they say and open our eyes to the fact that we need to work for change rather than expecting it to fall out of the sky. In the same way we work to earn our rizq. In my opinion one of the greatest examples of our current plight is the famous hadith of our beloved Prophet wasallam when he said the people will summon one another to attack you like people when they are eating and they invite others to share their food. Someone asked him Will that be because of our small numbers at the time? And he sallallahu alayhi wasallam replied, No, you will be numerous at that time, but you will be like the froth that is carried by a torrent of water. And Allah will take the fear of you from the breasts of your enemy and cast al-wahan into your hearts. Someone asked, O Messenger of Allah, what is al-wahan? And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam replied, Love of the world, and dislike of death. You see this hadith not only describes our situation but the very cause of our situation and the solution. Our situation certainly is one where Muslims are being attacked from every angle. It really is like everyone grabbing whatever they please. It's just like food. We can't fight back. The fall of the Khilafah allowed our lands to be carved up and the treacherous rulers hold back our armed forces to prevent them from carrying out their Islamic duty. Furthermore, Allah blessed us with so much wealth. Much of the world's natural resources are in the Muslim lands, be it the oil in the Middle East or the natural resources of Africa. That's why we are a feast for our enemies. And when the Prophet ﷺ describes that we will be numerous in number, does it not point to the fact that we are nearly 2 billion in number? But as the saying goes, it's not about quantity, but quality. Just like those Muslims in Badr, outnumbered three to one. 
or the Muslims at the Battle of Yarmouk, outnumbered seven to one. Isn't it really like that froth on the water that the Prophet ﷺ described? It's blown away so easily, it has no substance. That froth is on top, so you think it has some strength, but truly it goes in whichever direction the water below goes, not in control and blown away so easily. And the Prophet ﷺ even describes the very cause of this situation. He tells us it is because of al wahan in our hearts, the love of life, the fear of death. Of course, we might say it's normal to fear death, but look how materialistic we have become. This life is everything, our wealth, our friends, our family, our businesses. Do we really yearn to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do we yearn for Islam to be strong again? Remember what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Tawbah. He said, say, if it be that your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your mates, your kindred, the wealth that you have gained, the commerce in which you fear a decline, or the dwellings in which you delight are dearer to you than Allah or his messenger or striving in his cause, then wait until Allah brings about his decision and Allah guides not the rebellious. Does Allah not make clear what should be our order of priority? But thankfully, the Prophet ﷺ also gave us the solution. We need to reverse our current situation. We need to remove the al wahan from our hearts. We need to strive in his cause. Be willing to sacrifice. What was the Prophet's cause? His cause was to build that very state which was abolished 96 years ago. He became the shield which protected us by becoming the leader who commanded the armies to spread Islam and protect Muslims from oppression. It was after him that the Khalifas were selected to succeed him. Succeed him in what? The duty of ruling by Islam, protecting the Muslims and spreading Islam. When we hear people say Khulafa Rashidun, remember that it refers to the rightly guided Khalifas those that succeeded our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, our beloved Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, may Allah be pleased with them all. We love them so much, yet we don't appear to want to emulate them and work for Islam to be dominant once again. Today we are presented with a very personal version of the Prophet's life, not the version where he worked for an Islamic state, not the version which pushes us to change society. But the Prophet guided us to what we should do when he said, Whosoever of you sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. And if he is not able to do so, then let him change it with his tongue. And if he is not able to do so, then with his heart. And that is the weakest of faith. These three options are not a choice. It's based on capability. If we have the physical capability, then we change it physically. Those leaders who have the physical capability, they should be changing it physically. We do not have that physical capability, but we have our tongue. We have the ability to speak out, so we should be speaking out against it. We cannot by default just hate it in our hearts when we have the capability to speak out. So we need to raise awareness of the need for Islamic unity under the banner of La ilaha illallah, not nation states which maintain the very problems Muslims are facing. We shouldn't be frightened to call for this. To be frightened is the shaitan whispering in our ears about preferring the dunya over the akhirah. To be frightened is to maintain al wahan in our chests. Remember, you would be calling for Islamic governance. You would be calling for Allah's sharia to be implemented. You would be calling for that which our beloved Prophet ﷺ called for. And who do we fear more? The creation? or our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we not heed our Prophet sallallahu wasallam's words when he said, if they were to gather together to harm you with anything, they would not harm you except with what Allah had already prescribed for you. So why should we fear? Dear listeners, the 3rd of March 96 years ago turned us into billions of individuals each one of us fending for ourselves and for our families. We were pushed towards looking for solutions outside of Islam, pushed towards nationalism, pushed towards charity as a means of battling oppression, pushed towards asking our oppressors to save us. 
Isn't it about time we awaken from our slumber and start seeking solutions from Islam again by opening the eyes of our brothers and sisters to the need to bring back Islamic unity, to bring back the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to bring back that which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam worked so tirelessly for and to bring back the Khilafah, our shield, to protect ourselves once again.